Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Exploring the Viking World with yours truly, CJ Adrian. Today, I have a couple of guests joining me, which is absolutely fantastic, uh, because up until now, it's been me lecturing at a camera, <laughs> and uh, it's fun, as much fun as I have doing that, uh, definitely uh, makes it more fun when there's other people on the show. First, I'd like to introduce Taylor, who's a blacksmith, who'll be joining us for this conversation. Uh, he's a friend of mine who's going to be joining me on some other videos later on, too. Uh, so just bringing him into the fold now just to kind of start start that process. Uh, and then I have with us the authors of the book, Men of Terror, a Comprehensive Analysis of Viking Combat. I have Rainer Oskarsson. I know I butchered your name. I apologize. Uh, but uh, he's one of the authors. And then I have William R. Short of Hurstvik. Did I pronounce that correctly? Pretty close. Hurstwick. Hurstwick. Okay. Nothing fancy. It's just a made up word. <laughs> yeah, I, I watched uh, an interview that you did with um, Jackson Crawford. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where you, you went over the pronunciation and evidently that name is made up. It's just made up. Yeah. It was, uh, the people who made it up thought it sounded Viking, but it, it's not. It's not even remote. Uh, okay. Well, what's the inspiration for the name? Uh, they just wanted a name. So uh, the founders of Hurstwick, which founded it about a year before I joined, just wanted something that sounded cool. And they came up with that. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> awesome. I think um, it, they thought it had some Anglo-Saxon or connections. Whether it does or not, probably. Who cares? It sounds cool, at least. So yep. we yep. with that. Yep. It sounds cool. It's style points. It's definitely style yep. points. <laughs> yeah. And we've just stuck with it over the decades. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I've actually been familiar with the, the, that organization for a while. I started my journey um, kind of in the, so because the, there's a big social circle around Vikings and so forth online. And I jumped into the fray, I think, in about 2011. And I know mm -hmm. you guys were already rock and rolling at that point. Yep. And so you have yep. a lot of great articles about uh, clothing and armor and weapons and, and so forth uh, that yep. um, I've always found very helpful. So, Yeah. Just so you know, CJ, we're in a massive program to update all the web articles and we've already undertaken that. So a lot of the articles have been updated and are, are, are have been modernized and the research has just gone a lot deeper. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, cool. Well, let's get going. I've got some questions for you. Uh, okay. As we discussed at the beginning, I have my list of questions. I will stick to them in a very loose fashion, uh, and we'll see where the conversation takes us. But the first one is, and I love asking this of anyone who's written a book, uh, and it is, who are you and why are you the best person to have written this book? And I figured we'd start with Rainer, and then we'd move on to William and see, and you can, you can piggyback off of each other, too. I, I will start. Uh, so who I am, I actually starts with the meeting William. Uh, uh, I met him what what was it two thousand something when the financial collapse happened. Two thousand eight, I think. Uh, two thousand eight. There was a small small advertisement in a paper and uh, humongous things happening in Iceland. And I saw yeah some American teaching us about Viking fighting. I'll I'll take a look. But I was not interested in Vikings at all. Just had no interest in them. The, I'm born here, so there is a Viking culture all around, and we are forced to read the sagas in school and so on, but nothing that lured me to Vikings. And then I went to the lecture, and I could clearly see that he knew what he was talking about. There was something a little bit off about his research, so I contacted him. And my previous background is a martial artist. And uh, he said, uh, I mean, you don't ask uh, experts in, uh, in Vikings and combat, these two, two really testosterone-filled words, uh, if they're wrong. But I did, and he said, yeah, well, maybe. Tell me what you, what you think is off, and let's work on it. So, uh, and I will ask why I'm the absolute best person in the universe to write a book about this uh, topic. It's because uh, mostly I'm an idiot. Uh, 
I, I had no previous background in Vikings. I was not a reenactor. I was not a scholar. I was not an academic. I didn't know what people had said about Vikings before that time. So when I met William, uh, I asked him questions uh, uh, about things. And sometimes the answer was, well, somebody in the 1950s said it. And that's how it became truth. So I had to ask, well, how did he know? So that's how we did our research with really a, a sort of a blank slate. But that's really Blanks common. So that's really common in Viking studies. It's like, oh, well, this guy in the 1950s came out with a book and we just haven't questioned it since. <laughs> yes, a, a massive amount, just more than I would believe, I would believe it initially. Yeah. We just came across that again and again and again in our research for the book is, you know, we see several different sources saying something was so and finally trace it back to this book long ago and no clear indication how that fellow how that author knew that it was so so that was for me one of the big breakthroughs in the book was just throwing all that away and really looking deeply into all the topics we were talking about and doing some really deep research uh, and I think if you were to ask me what I bring to this, it's that uh, scientific background and that uh, idea that we really want to, to test things deeply. Uh, we use many, many sources and uh, Rainer came up with the, the label layered sources. So, you know, if we were trying to understand um, like uh, we found a, a, a UFO, a spaceship that had crashed in the desert and we wanted to figure it out, we're not just going to look at the hyperdrive engine. We're going to look at all the pieces. And that's what we do with Vikings. So we take one source and layer it on top of the next source, on top of the next source, on top of the next source. So we take literary sources and put them on top of pictorial sources and put them on top of archaeological sources and so on. And what's really important is that all the sources have to point in the same direction. If something points in a different direction, if we put something on top of our layered sources and it points in a different direction, we need to understand why. You know, these layered sources build up a solid foundation and a strong understanding and allow us to see what's going on. And if something doesn't fit, we've got to stop and figure out why and, and what's wrong. Maybe our understanding is wrong and the whole house of cards collapses. Or maybe uh, it's just an outlier and we're not looking for the outliers. We're looking for the common thread that runs throughout everything um and maybe it's just misinterpreted and in our research the rainer came up with a really classic example of that right. it will throw me under the bus yep <clears throat> yeah, uh, preferably i'd like to do it later in the interview but let's just start with a bang uh <laughs> sorry uh, sorry uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I had done was uh, I had studied uh, the empty-handed fighting of Vikings uh, quite uh, deeply. And all the sources pointed in one direction, but uh, there was an artifact, an uh, uh, artifact in a museum in Norway that depicted uh, the empty-handed fighting in a different way than I had perceived in all the other sources. So I had to just scratch my hat. Here we have an artifact from the 11th century why doesn't it fit with everything else? So it ended with me just having to call the museum and can you check this again? This just isn't possible. And I was thought to be much, much uh, younger. Or some say from the 19th century. Uh, so yeah, so that's where the sources, when they don't fit together, sometimes something's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's how you can put holes. So, uh, so your background specifically is, it was in martial arts. And that's what you yeah. put on the table to then combine with William's knowledge of, of the sources and, and so forth to then come up yeah. with a synthesis of here's what we think the unarmed combat looked like um, based on based on the what we have available to us. Which interestingly, now that's a that's a that's a kind of a big deal, right? You went to to somewhere in Norway and kind of pointed at an artifact that they had that they had made some assumptions from. And then said, wait, this doesn't fit with what we've done. And then they actually came out and were like, yeah, maybe this is something newer. CJ, we just changed history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, with the Vikings, we do that a lot, right? Because going back to 
there's so many books from the 1950s that were like, oh, it must be true because this guy from the 1950s said it's true, you know, and, yeah. and yeah, that's something I deal with in my research is that the cross-referencing has to be uh, absolutely exhaustive, right? Like yeah. it's, it's um, especially since contemporary sources are so unreliable in general, mm -hmm. just they have mm -hmm. their own bias, they have their own political aims, etc. So trying to figure out, you know, who was where at what time is just a matter of piecing together like, well, I have eight different sources that put them in the same place at the same time for the same reason. And so, and then I could say, you know, he was probably there, right? But even then, I have to be really careful, right? It's, it's a lot of, uh, most likelies or perhaps is, you know, <laughs> not very strong language. You mean I can't just watch a Wagner opera and know everything about? No. No, no, really? <laughs> really? Oh. <laughs> oh, no, the zeitgeist uh, has changed and it's, it's changing still today, like how we view them. We need to put up uh, in the Wagnerian time, we need to put up these noble heroes uh, classes and today we need to put up uh, uh, different classes uh, to look at them and we try to take them all off just mm -hmm. to see what is yeah now the the importance of zeitgeist is is something that uh we realized during this research how important it is not to try to reflect our modern ideals onto the Viking Age, because we see this more than a few times in people doing Viking research. The, you know, the Viking times are very different than today. And so what we would like, the way we would like things to be today is not the way they were in the Viking Age. Things that we would find uh, completely disgusting were the norm in the Viking Age. And to reflect our modern ideals back on that age is to make a major mistake. And we'll try to be really careful about uh, avoiding that approach to our research. Uh, the word we use is this modern mindset. You know, we have this picture in our mind and zeitgeist is only one of several examples of that. And if we try to reflect that back onto the Viking age and impose it on the Viking age, we are going to make a mistake. Yeah, when I, uh, when I taught school, we, one of the first things I would do I would go through is uh, the cultural lens and so it, it was physically represented as as uh i know the french word but i'm spacing uh, uh, our the, spy glass yeah there we go yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. the different layers of, of of glass and then each layer is kind of a different layer of ourselves right of what makes mm -hmm. us who we are and how we see the world and then so when you start and then by the time you get to the end it's no wonder we all see things very differently um mm -hmm. And so it's, of course, we're, we're, and I had a great professor in college who he had this uh, atrociously long, I think 60,000 word essay on bias, and he made us all read it. And <laughs> it was really interesting, but it, it definitely uh, informed me at least that on, on uh, how careful we have to be when we're looking at these things um, and how inevitable it is that at some point, you know, we're going to put something of ourselves in there. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I, I find your book really, um, really interesting because you guys have worked together as a team and when you have two perspectives and two very different perspectives, uh, it helps to really flush out some of those, some of those uh, problems. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to move on to one of the next uh, questions. So I really like this one. When, when we're putting together a book, um, I always like to think of who is the audience? Who's your kind of audience in mind? Uh, was this more of a passion project? Did you make this book for yourselves? Like I know there's a lot of people who do that. It was just for me, just out of curiosity. Or did you have a specific audience in mind? Uh, Rainer, you mentioned we changed the world. Was that what you set out to do? Or was it more of a, uh, a, a just a personal journey? Uh, I wish I had said change the world. I said change history, but uh, can we edit it later? So I said something <laughs> from, more traumatic like that. Uh, nah, nah, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Uh, so, uh, the, again, I'm not a scholar, not an academic, but I had to read a lot of academic papers uh, for this book and for our research. And uh, many of them, especially when it comes to anything Viking related, is just... Uh, they use so difficult flowery words that when you translate it all, you see, whoa, the substance was not deep. It was just really, uh, really a play with words uh, using all kinds of scholarly words. So I thought, number one, everybody should be able to read this. They don't need to look up any word or anything. It needs to be just stated in a clear way. 
And number two, uh, it needs to, uh, so in, in, in some sense, we were writing it for ourselves. I would like to read a book that you can read just normally and you can see what it's about right away. And it should be filled with sources, with the references. So if we made a statement, we should be able to back it up. And there are like massive amounts of uh, footnotes there. You can see it was a horrendous job going through them. One of the worst uh, things in my life, uh, put it that way. <laughs> so in answer to your question, CJ, if I may jump in here, I think yeah. we wrote it for human beings. You know, we want everyone to read it, but we want it to be useful for academics. So we have deep research. We have extensive footnotes. I think there were something like 2000 footnotes when we submitted it to the publisher. And but we also want it to be readable by the general public. Anyone with a fascination for Vikings should be able to read this and benefit from it. So that was our target audience. I mean, it started as a project internal for Hurstwick. Um, we'd been doing research for more than 20 years, and Rainer and I had the idea of just putting it together in some sort of package for internal Hurstwick use so people could see what had been done, what the results were, what the next experiments might be so that they could start contributing to some of the ideas for the experiment. So we created this document and it was an outline form, but it was a hundred pages. It was a huge amount of data. And Rainer and I decided maybe this really should be a book so that more people could benefit from the research we had done because very little of it had been published in any form and, and we'd just like to spread the word. So we started working on the book and uh, that's when COVID hit. And so it was the perfect COVID project for both of us. You know, it's something that we collaborated on uh, long distance and, uh, and uh, finished up. Okay, and now William, you have, a, you have a background in academia, I believe, right? No, not so much. I'm not a university professor or anything like that. I do have a background in science and engineering. Um, I, I got a doctor of science degree from MIT and did research in a lot of different fields. Most of them were related to acoustics and human hearing, but in a lot of different things and uh, became aware that there were these things called sagas and started reading some and really liked them and wanted to learn more and actually took a summer course at the University of Iceland and that sort of sealed my fate. Uh, really fell in love with the stories and the place and the people. And uh, about 15 years ago, I quit my day job to do Hurstwick full time. Wow, that's awesome. Gosh, that's like where I'm headed, right? It's just yeah. moving. <laughs> I quit my day job. <laughs> take it with you, take it with you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as the book's concerned, I, I do uh, I do appreciate you know when I was reading the book, I do find it find that it was very accessible, um, and because uh, a lot of a lot of books can be uh, very dry, very monotone, and then you know I've read some. I have I have a whole list of primary source translations up here where you just. You get 15 minutes in, you cross your eyes. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but your book was great. Um, where I'd like to, to focus the discussion today, uh, since it's, it's really more of a, I think it, it's very applicable to my research and then also my journey too, as, as, uh, as you know, I do the historical fiction novels too. Mm -hmm. And the, everything that you put together about the Viking mindset, right? And that was something that I was interested in because I had to get into a Viking's head. Uh, not any old Viking, but probably the most notorious Viking of the ninth century, uh, named Hasting or Hastin, right? Uh, and uh, had and it's like what what makes him tick? Uh, and and I'm I'm really dismayed that this book didn't come out like six years ago <laughs> when I was doing my research for that because when I read through it and I was like, okay, I could see where like I did it. I, I was okay. I was like, yes, I hit on that and I hit on that. But then you had some details in there where I was like, oh, I like, I feel like I missed an opportunity, you know, like, oh gosh, like I was so close, but like just not quite. Um, but in talking about the Viking uh, uh, mindset, I'd like to start with kind of what, um, I want to be careful too. I don't want to just call it the Viking mindset because it's we're really talking about Viking Age Scandinavians, mm -hmm. um, and so when we say Viking, there's today we say Viking like it includes everybody, uh, mm -hmm. but really the the 
the more the narrower definition of the word is you know the people who left home on an adventure right um so viking age scandinavians trying to get into that mindset you know what made them tick and i'd like to discuss the we have in in the book you have the old norse words uh and then we don't have a good translation for them so um uh the way that you describe it in the book is just kind of in a, a longer form this is this is this is the spirit that that word encapsulated and i like to kind of start at the beginning and kind of work our way into how how uh a man from the Viking age who is thinking about betaking himself a Viking, kind of what, what would have been going through his head as he's about to take that journey. Rainer, do you want to start? <laughs> I know, that was a really yeah, big question. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before Rainer starts though, I'd like to say one thing. You know, we, Rainer and I, tend to use the word Viking in the very generic way. And understandably, the, the word has a whole lot of different connotations. People use it differently. And we tend to use it to mean any of the Northern European people in the early medieval period. So we don't use it as narrowly as it was used back in the Viking age. And one of the big breakthroughs for us was understanding what it meant to be a Vikinger in the Viking age, a Viking. And we came across a, a, a really clear explanation in one of the literary sources. Um, uh, Vikinger is someone who Herja and Stella, but does not Reina. Is that correct, Rainer? Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah terrible yeah. pronunciation, but correct. Sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll turn it over to you then. <laughs> No, 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 no. Yeah. So one of the things that was important for our research was figuring out what these words mean, because if we don't understand what the words mean, then we can't possibly understand what a viking is. And so herja is cognate with the English word to harry, uh, you know, to basically to fight. But that word seems to be used not only for raiding, but also for dueling. So there's this close connection between raiding and dueling. Um, and the law codes treat both activities more or less the same. And uh, uh, Stella means to steal, to take someone's property with his knowledge. And the Reina means to rob someone, to take his property by stealth without his knowledge. So one was perfectly okay in the Viking age and the other was, was, was not, it was uh, revolting. And so a Viking is someone who raids or duels and who steals, takes people's property with their knowledge. And so once you have this understanding of what a Viking really is, then it starts becoming more clear what their activities were. Hmm. I think it was in the saga of Egil Skallagrimson. Um, mm -hmm. It's mentioned twice, isn't it? It's uh, the first one is, aha, hang on, I think I can remember from memory. Lahan i vikingu, Lothheriathi, something like that, right? It's the, and um, uh, uh, I probably butchered that horribly, but it's, uh, uh, but basically he left home to rove is, is what it translates to roughly. I might be misquoting. I think I wrote a blog about it. And then there's another mm -hmm. one where um, it was used as an action word in the first passage. Mm -hmm. And then in the se second packet uh, passage, it was used as a noun both mm -hmm. ways in the Icelandic sagas, which is interesting. So already back then, we're using the word as both the action word, but then also to describe a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And not only that, it's even earlier than that. It's in some of the rune stones that actually date from the Viking Age. Mm -hmm. Really? The 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 word uh, Viking, the Viking on rune stones? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I didn't know that. Wow. Huh. Huh. So yeah, I mean, the, the word, uh, sorry, sorry, Taylor, please. Oh, I was just going to say a kind of tangential question but like um that concept of stealing versus robbing and dueling and raiding kind of being the same thing is that well it's kind of a chicken and the egg question for me is that inspired by the mythology uh the norse mythology that is kind of famous or is that what led to the perception that that's what the mythology was really based around i'm thinking you know um uh, I might not be articulating that clearly, but it's this concept to me that it really feels like that's the Viking culture of it's important to to show off the prowess in battle, the, the those kind of stereotypes we have of the 
modern Viking, you know, oh, Valhalla and dying in battle and that kind of stuff. Is that possibly where that culture comes from is looking back at those sources and saying, okay, you know, they raiding and uh, dueling are the same thing to them. Stealing is honorable, but robbing is not. Is, is there kind of that connection? Does that make sense? I, I will answer something, William. You'll just uh, correct everything I say. Uh, so uh, if I understand you, it's uh, did uh, what's it? Did man make God or did uh, God make man? So uh, let's put that aside. Uh, uh, I don't think it is stereotypical. So when we uh, intended, uh, when William started uh, looking into only the combat of Viking. It was just to provide some support to all, all the other research. We didn't think it was any, uh, it had any humongous merit. But after we wrote this book, we thought, well, if you don't understand the combat, it is really hard to understand Vikings in general. Yeah. Every single source, mythology, foreign sources, uh, domestic sources, archaeology, they all point to violence, a violent world. So uh, I don't think it's a stereotypical thing. You could even see in Hauramor, the first verse, uh, whenever you enter uh, a room, look around you because you don't know where danger is and so on and so forth. It's in every single source. It's not like it's uh, occasionally mentioned. It's yeah. just all around. It's not just the, uh, the kind of Christian telling of history that came afterwards that was trying to paint them as barbarian. It's just universal is violence. Uh, that's, I, mean, that's another, I think the Christians absolve themselves of violence. Of the, right? exactly. they, 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 <laughs> as victims, they're like, oh, they're horrible, and they come in and they, they're doing these terrible things to us, you know, kind of ignoring the fact that Charlemagne, you know, did the massacre on the Elbe and you know, oh, murdered everything. Saxons like yeah. it was nothing. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's another problem. That's the sort of this uh, zeitgeist uh, somebody said in the 1950s, how we view sources. Uh, so usually it's uh, here's a source and you need to know is it good or not before you check it so uh, and who said it was good or not somebody in the 1950s or now in 2022 well they're just nonsense or it's the pure truth so we we try to take all that away before we read it so if christians were involved we will see it but it should follow the same order as all the other sources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I probably didn't answer any question uh, over just blabbering. So I'll throw <laughs> no, it to no, that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. definitely a great answer. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. To me, it's just it's so interesting that 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 was a great summation of how I would think of a Viking culture is just that comparison between dueling and raiding are the same thing. Stealing versus robbery is such a that one. It one truly follows a code of honor more than the other, and it really. It sums it up in a really succinct way, I think. Yeah, yeah and then it pulls us back into the mindset here of, because then we're looking at culture, right? Mm -hmm. Which in culture affects mindset. And then they had these specific words that carried meaning. Uh, and I'm just pulling up a couple of them. We had drenger, yep. right? And austere. Yep. Uh, probably mispronouncing those. I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. I can I can certainly mispronounce them in French as well, if that helps. <laughs> it's softer on the ears. It's a it's a nice language, but <laughs> uh, but let's yeah let's kind of go through and 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 talk about those um, starting kind of at the beginning. Yeah, William, we'll throw you under the bus. Okay, I'll give it a try. So when we started understanding how important mindset was we started sort of from scratch we we threw away what we knew and started all over again something that comes through again and again and again in many many sources rune stones literary sources and so on is this concept of drenger it is what all viking men and women aspired to be to be a drenger and in all these sources going far back up to the present day, Drenger is always translated as a valiant man or an honorable man or something along those lines. And that just didn't make sense. It didn't mesh with all the other things we were seeing. 
And so one of the things that we did for this book was go through every possible source we could, the literary sources, rune stones, and so on. And, and this, this concept of drenger shows up in many of the Viking Age rune stones. So, you know, uh, so-and-so was a drenger, it says so on his memorial stone. So what does this mean? Um, and what comes out is that it is a man who can be trusted. To be a drenger is related to trust. Uh, a drenger is the person you want next to you, a person who will fight with you in a battle to the death, who will not flee in battle, who will tell you if he hears of a plot against you, who will be at your side right to the end, someone you can trust. And that is super important in a violent society like uh, the Viking society. So uh, a, a, a drenger was uh, what everyone wanted to be. And do you want to add to that? Am I missing something? No, no, no. Well, just uh, that it's, uh, uh, we use man also in the big word. It, it relates yeah. to women as well, but it has yeah, yeah. changed. It changed the flow really quickly into only men. Yeah. But in the Viking age, it seemed to be women and men. Yeah, yeah. So today, Atlantic means young boy, or, but still the same in, in a legal setting. If you don't want to swear on the Bible, you can swear on your drinks cupper uh, to tell the truth in, in court. So, yeah, but this is one of the keys. And uh, I, will, I will go back a little bit further back. Uh, when we actually, when I met William first time, I was scared shitless that my previous martial background would uh, pollute what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So we might have done it like... Uh, a Korean uh, fighting system or Filipino fighting system, whatever. But uh, so I was really scared. And William was scared that his previous background, uh, uh, walking the path of uh, reenactors and scholars, uh, would also pollute. So he decided, uh, like we've mentioned a gazillion times, wipe the state clean and ask ourselves if we take away the uh, attire of Vikings and you take away the weapons of Vikings. And we take, a, take them away from the homeland, give them a new cloth, uh, cowboy costume, and a new weapon, let's say a baseball bat. How would they fight? How would we know that these are Vikings fighting? And that uh, changed everything. So that's where the mindset comes uh, immensely strong in. I, I think they, they just put together the new History Channel show about Vikings. Yes. Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A real Viking and put him in a cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I just like to, yeah, I'd like to amplify that if Brenner is not going to go on because it is so critical. It's so critical to understanding the Viking mindset, the, Vi the way Vikings fought, and also about Viking society. Uh, it's, it's not any of these external things like clothing or weapons or anything else that determines how they fight. It is their mindset. And so if you took away these external markers, you'd still know that it was Vikings because of the way they fought. And so understanding that helps us understand Viking combat. And that was one of the, um, I'd say, breakthroughs in the research for this book is, you know, we use the layered sources, we look for the common thread, and what we were trying to create was a holistic picture of Viking combat. And that holistic picture seems to have three pillars holding it up. One is the mindset that we've been talking about, and there's two others. The two others are the empty hand combat and the improvisation that was so much a part of Viking fighting. So not technique driven at all. You just do whatever you need to do to, to, to win the fight, as long as you can leave the fight as a drinker. And uh, that was key to understanding how they fought, how they thought about their situation, what it is they did. So those three pillars, one of which is, is the mindset we've been talking about. Now, there's another aspect to mindset that is key. You know, Drenger is someone you can trust. And there's other aspects to this mindset as well. Is that something you'd like to talk about, Rainer? Yeah, okay. You start the subject and the conversation, and then you throw it at me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fast. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, why is it important to be a drinker? Because, uh, of course, people trust you in society and want to be associated with you in society. And this goes for combat as well as business. It's somebody who won't cheat you in business. And uh, if you are a good drinker, and uh, you gain orstir, which means word glory, which means people are speaking about you. Uh, 
preferably after your death, uh, giving you eternal life. Uh, then you then you are sort of set in stone. This is the highest idea of a Viking that people are still talking about him. It's good for his uh, for his uh, next of kin, for his son or daughter, or his family, because he is still uh, sort of uh, around the family. Uh, this good name, uh, like uh, how old was it? Stanza seventy six. <laughs> That uh, everything can die, your cattle can die, your you yourself can die, but your orstir, your your world glory, if you get if you get a good one, it will never die. Yeah, probably the most famous verse and most quoted verse from Havamal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Reminds right. me of the um, what's that saying? The uh, you die twice. The first times when you die, the second times the last time someone says your name. Yeah, like that. Yeah, kind of yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or. Uh, yeah. Uh, even just in my book, uh, my main character starts, it's in the third paragraph where he quotes his own father who says, one day I will die, your mother will die, and your brothers and sisters will die, and you, my son, will die. What does not die is the reputation a man leaves behind at his yeah. death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You're talking about something that's like, I, I, even I put it, third paragraph in my book. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and it ties in really well with some other research that I've seen. Um, one of the things that I've been really uh, curious about is like, why, why did the, the so-called Viking Age start? Why did Scandinavians feel compelled to leave home? And it, nobody else was at the time, right? Like it, there were population movements, but really the Vikings were driven to leave home. And uh, the archaeologist um, Soren Sindebeck uh, put together a really good, some good research and he called it, you know, kind of this drive for social capital, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Social capital is basically the reputation you earn. And it was it was as valuable as currency. Mm -hmm. And you can use that currency, you know, and, and then it sounds like this austere um, concept is, is you know, if, if Dranger doesn't have a direct translation into English, perhaps social capital could be a good stand-in for it. Basically, just this mm -hmm. idea that this is, this is a reputation that you can use as, um, as currency you know, to affect the world around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this, this, this idea about uh, 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 sort of connecting uh, uh, currency with, with uh, drinkers, and uh, it has been done since, what was it, Sigurd Nordal, I thought, yeah. uh, was the first one who did it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it is, it is capital, uh, clearly, and, uh, and it is, uh, it has always been translated honor, but it is trust-infused honor. And uh, the opposite of that, is, of course, is Nidingur. And we still use it in Icelandic today. Nidingur is the worst of the worst. So somebody who uh, does really bad things to others is called a Nidingur. And, uh, but that uh, uh, Nidingur is what? It's a sort of shame. But it's it's it has this supernatural natural element as well connected to it. You could throw shame onto someone, you know, like a magical curse. You could yeah. put it on someone. Well, I was and, uh, I, when I was reading that passage in the book about the, and I couldn't help but laugh through part of it because I kept thinking about the show Norseman on Netflix where they had the kneading post. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> to curse their enemy and the one guy's dad walked into it they're like oh get out of there and they're, mm -hmm. and they're like oh, and, and they like and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because they're like there's not actually a power coming from the needing post but they shoot the guy with mm -hmm. the arrow out of principle <laughs> anyway they they did a really good job <laughs> yeah but yeah so all right, the, uh, all right. Hey, hey, please please Oh, no, I was just going to finish with the kneading. So the kneading is kind of the opposite of Drenger. So you're you're trying to achieve Drenger through austere, and then you're in avoiding the kneading uh, at all costs, right? Because that's that's basically the the stain to your reputation. Now, could could kneading be like um, absolved? Kind of like you know, in Christianity, you sin and then you can go be forgiven. You confess and you do all these things. Uh, was that was there a way to get out of kneading once once you became a kneadinger? The yeah, I'll, I'll take the first crack of it. So, uh, most likely by killing the person who called you an anger. That sounds that, uh, absolves me. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, was the that was the usual response. Uh, something had to be done, and something had to be done that was really drastic. 
Mm. And you, uh, of course, somebody could say, uh, you will be an Edinger if you don't show up to this duel. And uh, that is a very common thing that they raise effigies or, or, or poles if somebody uh, as a threat. Well, if you don't show up, then we'll do this. So you had to show up. So uh, we're talking about what made a uh, Viking tick. And that is Drinkur and Nýðingur and Ástýr. These are the sort of three humongous concepts. So uh, this, uh, I, I hope we can make it a little bit longer because this actually tells us everything there is, how a Viking would fight if we change his clothes and his weapons. Mm -hmm. Is what he's, what I will I will add to that that you know Orstir was more valuable to a Viking than life or death. I mean it was more important to achieve Orstir than it was to live, because in essence Orstir was immortal life. Um, so you did everything you possibly could to uh, achieve that Orstir, uh, and that that shows how Vikings fought. Uh, that was that was their goal in the fight. Mm. Yeah, honor. It's that. It's that forever honor to keep. It's right. Yeah. Have the have your deeds sung about in the in the songs mm -hmm. of the of the skalds, right? Yeah, um, it's it's worth adding a little bit too. You know, the the title of our book, Men of Terror, comes from a memorial runestone it was raised about a thousand years ago in Denmark to a man named Fradi. And the memorial stone says that Thradi was the first among Vikings and that he was a terror of men. And this rune stone proves that uh, Thradi achieved Orstir. You know, here it is a thousand years ago, and we're talking about him in this video chat. You know, he truly achieved Orstir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's remembered forever, right? Yeah. That's the, yeah. um, but it's, it, I find it like, it's that's a mindset in warrior cultures that I find is a recurring theme, you know, um, I think in in this context, it's more important, right, um, to a Viking. But if you think about later in the Middle Ages, which you have to imagine that some of this was imported into, let's say, French chivalry because of of the Normans, right? The Norman knights were like the first, and of course they had they adopted some things because they were, you know, they had French speaking. They're French speaking Danes for a while, right? <laughs> and uh, so you have to imagine, like in chivalry, I, I remember I did some coursework back in college on on chivalry, and then the professor put a picture of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, and he said, you know, who do you think is the most chivalrous? And everybody's like, well, it's Luke Skywalker, because he's honorable and valiant, and he's the good guy. And he was like, no, no, the, the, the best knight, the people who, the guy that people in the Middle Ages would have appreciated the most would have been Darth Vader, because he's ruthless, he has prowess, large, he's very wealthy, has large, you know, and these are concepts that I think would have been, are partly imported from some of this influence, even though, I mean, I can't, bridge it exactly but i can definitely see the threads right mm -hmm. where it, it kind of it so not only is this like interesting research that you guys have done but i'm also seeing where it's like you know this if this affected history a lot longer than one might think right like mm -hmm. vikings matter <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah the, the interest in vikings has never waited since the beginning of the Viking Age. <laughs> <laughs> I like your point earlier, uh, Rainer, about how it, it's very, it's a very brutalistic approach of problem solution. It's like, oh, someone's calling you, you know, dishonorable. What do you do? You kill them. Right. That's yeah. like, it's just it's a, the easy way to take care of it. Uh, or, and then if they run away, then, then they get exiled and then someone, <laughs> somebody else will kill them for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What, uh, so as far as, so this, we have the Viking mindset, you said the three pillars, you have the Viking mindset, and then you have the actual combat style, and then you have the improvisation. Um, so uh, if I may interrupt CJ, sure. uh, let me just clarify a little bit. So one was mindset, one was the empty hand combat. So not combat in general, but the empty hand combat. Okay. And the other one was this um, improvisation and the empty hand, that is where Rainer is the expert. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Klima. But it has uh, a few names uh, in the old sources. It's uh, Klima, Fang, Griau. But uh, Klima, of course, stuck because it became the national sport of Iceland. And uh, this is the only sport that survived the Viking Age. Uh, poetry. Even in Iceland, we, we, we lost our ability to swim or a skill to swim. 
something a, a crucial thing. But uh, we kept Klima throughout the throughout the ages, and we have an unbroken line of uh, sources that talk about Klima and it uh, how it evolved, how it changed, why it changed, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, and yeah, a few points: uh, the Klima Association of Iceland, the torchbearers uh, of Klima. Uh, uh, they haven't published anything in English. So uh, everything you read online in English, apart from our book and, and my article for UNESCO, the, you, I, you would have to check the sources. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, the, yeah, where was it going? So the, the Glima of old uh, was a power sport. Uh, if somebody was going to show his might and strength, he was asked, oh, are you going to clean or are you going to lift heavy stones? It was akin to that. So the, 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 the clima person's mentality is uh, aggressive and hat on. You need to take what is in front of you down. Really brutal. It's really strong. But you need to be constantly on guard. Constantly. When you do a wrong move, uh, the old word is uh, to give a wrestling place on yourself. So if you do the wrong move, your opponent can get the upper hand. So if you know, if you know the mindset is about uh, uh, the, the getting this uh, uh, concept of drinkus and being talked about, and we know that their empty hand is about power. So this we know. So then we can sort of assume that uh, if I strike you like this and I kill you, nobody will talk about it. But if I really take you apart as I kill you, people will be, ah, and when rain is uh, cut him in two, that was <laughs> so. So uh, everything is uh, interconnected. We talked about layered sources before. Like this must uh, show the same picture as this, and we do the same with other uh, aspects and concepts. So the mindset must fit with the empty hand. The empty hand must fit with the arm combat, and so on and so forth. Even our testing, when we test, we do layered testing. So how to use a sword. We need to try it in like 50 different ways to figure out how it was used. Uh, yeah, uh, am I missing something, William? No, I think you've got it. You know, a, a key aspect of, of our research is, is it has been in the testing. You know, especially when it comes to combat testing, we can't test it the way Vikings would have used it. You know, so much has changed. Our modern morals don't permit us to do the kinds of things that would have been done in the Viking age. And so we have to how shall I put it, create some sort of platform on which we can do our tests that fit with modern morality and modern laws. And that has been one of our breakthroughs is finding ways of testing these combative moves and these combative, uh, how shall I put it, styles uh, in a way that is safe in the modern age. And uh, by developing this platform on which we can work, uh, we've been able to really move forward in our combat testing. Right, because you're, you're the combat test, you're, you can't kill anyone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that would be a pesky little detail. Right? <laughs> yeah. Go yeah. More careful. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, uh, there's so many things that would have been routine in the Viking age, you know, using stones to smash someone to bits or throwing stones at people and, and, and you know, many other things and, and, and the, the brutal Glima throws and so on, um, you know, not something that we can do easily today. Right. And it's, it's also difficult because uh, most of combat testing, uh, historic combat testing has been done in even, even playing field uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, blood weapons. And what we are saying, and that's the next fundamental, that's this improvisational skill or, or tactical skill is, uh, well, how would have, what are we reading? How would they have happened, uh, the, the combat? And that's, they use the concept of me, for example, which is a, a preferred uh, fighting location. So if you and me were fighting, you were chasing me, I would run to a VE where I know I can fight better than you. And that's where loose stones are. That's where I have the height advantage. Now that you never get from a even playing field or the, just the aspect of throwing rocks before a, a fight. And uh, yeah, it's just full of it. The, we have the, the sort of use the same concept as Bruce Lee, using no way as way in our research. Just we have to try everything. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned uh, uh, so you could either glima and fight it, fight it out, or you could pick up a really heavy stone to show your strength. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So that'd be like a strongman training, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of like a so uh, it, like a you know I'm gonna pick up a heavy a heavy stone to show my strength and so so that I, I if I am remembering correctly, I believe there's in the sagas somebody who lifted up the mast of a ship on his back. And walked a couple of paces, but then it broke his back and he died. But still, he was, like, you know. And then, and then they had uh, 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 Bjornsson, Half Thor Bjornsson yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> from Iceland, who did it again a thousand years later. Um, so what? So, but for most people, it would have been Glima. But like, if somebody challenged, like, let's say I'm I'm there and I'm I'm challenged to Glima, could I just look at him and be like, I'm just gonna go pick up pick up this heavy rock instead? Like, was that an option? <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I, well, well, first of all, CJ, I don't know. Uh, second, uh, the games were not like games we we assumed they were. They like in the Olympics, they had the connection to the god and the. The participants who did well, they represented the district and became heroes, and their name was known as the sport hero. Now, that doesn't seem to be the case in the Viking Age. It was more like, uh, what are you worth here and now in this company here? So you could tell other people about it, but uh, I think there's barely any name associated with a sport, like uh, uh, Reynir the wrestler or anything. I think there's only one that I recall from all these uh, gargantuan amount of data. And these were not uh, for the faint of heart. Uh, in the log, <laughs> it says that uh, if you participate in a game, wrestling or skin liquor or so, uh, so on, then you are on your own responsibility. Right. So uh, what we read in the sagas left and right is that people are breaking their leg, breaking their arm, they have to limp home. This, these were the kind of games uh, this was either be that Knatik or Glima. So these are these are not uh, jolly games. These are uh, ruffian games to, to prove who you are, but only in that moment in time. Yeah. So you can- I find the law code actually pretty interesting. You know, basically what it says is that a man is free to leave a game anytime he wants. So if someone is injured in a game, it's his own fault. Oh, I like that. Yeah, so it's a. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's a competition for your life, right? Like you lose a tennis match, you go home, you get a pat on the back. It's yeah. all good. But in, in, in Lima, you, you could die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, your yeah. Calf pointed that way. But if you win, <laughs> if you win, then everybody, you're the talk of the town. And then that opens doors for you, you know, so. You've got Orstir. Orstir, yeah. But you, to your point, it doesn't go too much farther, right? Like, so if you were winning a game no. in a village and you went to some other village, they don't care that. That you have to put you're, but but uh, you are not as a sports hero like yeah. in, in ancient Greece. The, that is the difference. So your name is you get worth to your name, like we're talking about currency. But it's not uh, like okay, here's your sport currency. Got it. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. ancient Greeks had the pancration, and the only rule was you can't gouge out the other guy's eyes with your thumbs. But everything else was on the table. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah. it, you know, it's that's UFC on steroids, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, I just want to be mindful of of time uh, and uh, just uh, kind of keep things moving a little bit. The so as 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 far as the Viking combat styles and speaking of ancient Greece, in in your research and I was reading through, um, what what did you find was um, in terms of the actual combat style? And you mentioned you didn't want to corrupt it with your other knowledge of martial arts, but but could you speak to like what may have been imported and what may have been original to Viking Age Scandinavia in terms of that that fighting style? Hmm. So so first of all, uh, uh, my interpretation is uh, it makes it difficult to use the word style. Uh, I would rather use yeah. system because we're looking at the holistic system. So if you talk about Viking combat style. That would be maybe good enough with his bow instead of or, or is a, uh, instead of using a two-hand axe. So a system is this holistic idea, just like boxing is a system, and then you have boxing styles. Mm-hmm. You have the the uh, well, yeah, all these boxing styles. So to answer your question, what was borrowed and uh, uh, what was original? 
I have no idea if that is a good answer. Uh, like with the Klima, I, I, you could assume many things like, well, uh, Klima researchers, uh, I stand before me, have uh, pondered whether some of the uh, tricks, so the word for uh, throws and trips and so on, it's all tricks, which uh, tells us a lot. But uh, that'll be for a later uh, uh, interview. Uh, uh, but I, I never went there. It's just, uh, for me, it, it would be way beyond my scope. I just wanted to know what is, what am I looking at? William? No, I, I, I think that's good. I mean, I don't like the word style either. And if, if, you were, if you pressed me, CJ, I would say, I don't think they had a style per se. Uh, what seems to come out of our research is they did whatever they needed to do as long as they left the battlefield of Drengur with Orstir enhanced. And that's where a lot of this improvisation comes from. You, you just do whatever you have to do. If the weapon you've got in your hand is not right for that moment, you pick up something else that's better suited for the for the moment. And is just whether that be a stone to throw or something else. Many examples of that. Many weapons improvised. Um, so it's simply about cutting down with brute power and that comes from the glima the empty hand combat you you you, you face you, you take down what's in front of you with brute power and you do whatever it takes to do that as long as you can leave a drenger so the the final answer is we have no idea <laughs> <laughs> which so much of the viking age is that's where we end up right like ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so to, to that point though about doing whatever it takes is was there was there a kind of a viking code of chivalry in battle like no don't attack someone with, the, with their back to you or you know those kind of more later medieval you know dueling rules or was it really just whatever whatever it took you're gonna leave you know with with with, with victory what was, were there kind of any boundaries yeah okay i'll answer that so uh, uh first of all it's not about victory it's about your name so if you survive that, who cares? Uh, maybe nobody talks about you if you live. Uh, the second is yes, there were some there were some boundaries. Uh, some of them were uh, are a little bit hazy, so we didn't uh, fully uh, talk about them. But some of them are like don't attack the weak, don't attack women, and children, don't attack sleeping men. Uh, and then we have something that we have to. The, the, that we ha didn't find enough sources to really pinpoint like you could slap somebody with the flat of your sword and that would be just an insult or if you threw a spear at me and I threw it back at you and killed you that would be like yeah, well there goes my old steel <laughs> and, uh, uh, there, are, there are some uh, aspects like that but uh, they're not uh, as fully uh, fully formed as the rest of it. And we, we like I said, we really just wanted to uh, uh, get the complete analysis of the system. So if you see the system and then you can look at uh, everything with these, uh, uh, with that understanding, like if you understand how they think, then you can understand why they did this or this. And then you can also understand why on earth uh, they didn't do this. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, this is just a theory. Uh, now, uh, uh, this is again to the modern mindset. When we when we started uh, training, some of our students were thinking about uh, how to uh, interject punches and headbutts. So we were fighting sword and shield, and they thought, well, there's a perfect space here for a headbutt or, or an uppercut or whatever, what have you. And I thought, that's good. Did Vikings do it? That's number one. I don't care if you're going to do it or if it's applicable here and then we find well they didn't actually do it the few rare cases we see of punching is in out of control situations or anger and then i thought wait a minute uh, what is going on here if it is efficient if they know how to do it because they're clearly doing it in anger why aren't they doing it and uh, my theory personally is that it was an armed society it was a revenge society it was a violent society and if you break your hand, because the, the bones in the hand are not as strong as the skull oftentimes, well, then you can't grasp your weapon or you can't grasp your opponent. And then you are a little bit uh, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. 
or like they said, uh, bear skelter without a shield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes perfect. Yeah, you wouldn't want to hit somebody with your hand because if you break your hand, you can't you hold can't it. You can't bite, yeah. yeah. Ah. yeah. <laughs> and it's even reflected. It's even reflected in the law codes, which I find fascinating that the law codes pro prohibit kicking and punching. Ah, interesting. Why kicking, though? I don't know. You can't, <laughs> you can't stand, you can't fight. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah that, that's another theory. I mean, uh, wrestlers, uh, they're not kickers. They want their balance. They want their feet underneath them. Right. And to get power from anything, uh, one leg can't be in the air. Hmm. Chop down a tree, uh, you need both legs on the, uh, on the ground. <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm going to transition us into a, a, a new section of the, of the discussion. We're going to move on to arms and armor, and it's <laughs> it's, de it's debate time. Oh, good. Uh, so we're going to do uh, there. So the two of you, uh, I read it in the book, are familiar with this, and it is the lack of Viking, so-called Viking helmets in the archaeological record. Uh, so far, we have the Girbundu helmet. It's this guy. It's a replica. Uh, and that's pretty much it. There's a couple of fragments from Eastern Europe. There's a study that just came out that's really interesting. I have um, I haven't spent too much time on it, but uh, I guess there's other evidence for uh, basically it, it, what it points to is was the Girbundu helmet potentially imported from, from the East, right? Uh, but as far as the West, so uh, Ian, you even had a picture in the book. Um, from the uh, uh, Miracles of saint Aubin, uh, which is directly related to the research that I do. So that's the Brittany region of France. Um, and it sh it's a wood carving that shows, you know, the Breton soldiers and they're like cloth and like little, you know, helmets. And then it shows the Vikings as like ironclad and everything. And we, I think it's pretty obvious we know that that's probably not how they all dressed. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this idea of, of the, vi the helmets not being there, there's two schools of thought. And I wanted to get uh, your take on it, um, and particularly as it pertains to the Viking mindset, I was going to pick your brains about it. Uh, so the number one is uh, they used helmets, but then the helmets were broken down and repurposed, right, uh, over time. However, we have a lot of swords and axes and fragments of chain mail and so forth that weren't broken down, which could have been broken down similarly. So that's kind of the whole in that argument. And then the other one is they just didn't wear helmets at all, which sounds crazy. But after I read your book, I thought, oh, maybe not. Because when you think about the Viking mindset and you're trying to get, you know, austere, if you show up to a fight with a big helmet and a, and a chain mail shirt and you're all decked out and, and uh, the other guy isn't, right? Can you imagine the other guy taking you down with Glima? <laughs> so I just want to pick your brain on, do you think mindset may have played a part in, in this mystery of why there are no helmets uh, in the archeological record or few? Right, if I may, I'll start. Yeah. And uh, your point, CJ, is a good one. We don't know why there are so few helmets found in the archeological records. You know, Maybe they weren't placed in graves because virtually everything we have from the Viking age is uh, grave goods. Maybe for some reason, armor wasn't placed in graves, or maybe it just erodes so quickly. Chain mail erodes really quickly and helmets likely too. Um, or maybe they just weren't used very much and we don't know. I mean, the pictorial sources have loads and loads of examples of lots of armed men wearing what appears to be helmets and even a few examples they appear to be wearing mail. But the literary sources are not so strong there. Um, someone wearing a uh, helmet mail is not so common in the literary sources. Um, and so maybe it just wasn't so common for men to be uh, armored in the Viking age. And again, we really don't know. Uh, it appears that, um, you know, for a man not to have armor was not something out of the ordinary but you know the opposite of that for a man not to have a shield as a defense was was something mentioned uh, more than a couple times in the literary sources someone doesn't have a shield you know he's he's undefended and so we can we can kill him easily so maybe that was the difference really don't have a good answer for why there's so few found in the archaeological sources Rainer? Yeah, in the literary sources, it's mostly the 
the king and his men, his hirth, that are uh, armored. It, it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to apply to the average man. So why they don't uh, why they haven't done it, I don't know. I, I, I think we can only isn't, I think there's only one example of men not wearing mail because it was too hot. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I have no idea yeah. uh, anything else. Yeah. But they, was there anything uh, that you found that would, would indicate that? So we have the shield example, right? So you have the mm -hmm. if he doesn't have his shield, he's undefended. But then was there any sort of of um, uh, any sort of like counter or like blowback for wearing any types of armor, or like somebody showed up a little bit too decked out, it's like you're cheating kind of thing. You know, could you get need for being overly armored? Like it's, I, I, it just, it would be an interesting thing to explore to say maybe part of why, like, you know, like as you mentioned, it's the in the grave goods is where we find everything. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Rainer, you have the hearth that, you know, they're the ones who are armored. Well, those are the people who end up in grave sites, right? So uh, we are, so we we do, so we do have a lot of different things, which points to somebody was wearing most of everything, but then helmets are just conspicuously absent. I don't know, maybe it was a, like a, uh, uh, maybe to get austere, you wanted to make sure people saw your face. Kind of like in Hollywood, where they're like the bad, you know, all the heroes don't wear helmets, right? Why? Well, because we want to see the main actors' faces, right? Uh, but then maybe that was something. So I'm just kind of musing, just kind of throwing it out there, like, uh, what? How, how could they be related? Um, just for a little fun. <laughs> when you bring in the fun, you're the funny yeah, guy. Yeah, I'm the funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good answer, CJ. We, we, we really have no idea. I do not have a sense from any of the things I've looked at that says people didn't wear armor because it was unfair or because it didn't contribute to Orsi or anything like that. My sense is that if people had it, they would wear it. And if they didn't have it, it wasn't such a big deal. Right. And as, as you mentioned, Rainer, it's whatever it takes, right? So then you can add in... Um, uh, whatever you needed to to make sure that you you won the fight, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like if you not armored, that's your risk you're taking. Like you right. you are taking the risk of being unprotected to try and get more glory, but they're not going to look bad at the person who is wearing the armor. Right. Like, okay, that makes sense. But if you want to push the risk and get more glory, but yeah. would you get more austere for being unarmored versus armored? You know, like oh, yeah, you know, I don't know, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, I don't get any sense of that from from thinking through the the literary sources examples in the literary sources that you know i killed this guy in armor therefore i get more or or i killed this person without armor so i get less or i don't see too many examples of that yeah, and then, that, then also it wouldn't be about the shield either the shield is clearly the main defense yes, yes. and people without shield is not like okay he's going for it it's more like what an idiot let's kill it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh well that makes sense so then you could potentially well so then the mystery continues why yeah. are there no helmets yeah anyway, that's yeah. one that it's it, i for some reason i just latch on to that topic because it's so fascinating i'm like we don't know yeah yeah. I don't think uh, that is the that is uh, the core of everything we do. It it is the mystery. It is this interesting mystery that we have no idea. We're just trying to figure out something. That is uh, everything that is exciting about the uh, Vikings to me. Just this yeah. puzzle. Yeah. I had a I had a friend who actually uh, and he had he knows nothing about Vikings, right? But we were just talking and he was and, and it was just a natural conversation. But at one point he just kind of threw out because I brought this up just as a fun topic to talk about and he just said well didn't they all have like really fancy hairdos and they just didn't want to ruin it <laughs> so, they, so they didn't wear helmets i was like ah, you, i mean that's as good a guess as any <laughs> yeah, yeah. but we can all agree no horns no horns no, no horns. Horns. <laughs> back to your uh, yeah back to your wagner opera that's where it came yeah, from exactly right yeah. that was yeah. all said in the wagner opera in the 19th yeah, century exactly just in, stuck some cow horns up there and called it good in berlin Although I always say they drink out of horns, right? Yeah. They have the mead, the mead horn, the sond, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so if you put horns on a helmet, it was the first beer helmet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the, that's the football team got it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.
like I think it's the biggest mistake of Vikings ever. They they should have had horns on the helmet. They would, they would look insanely cool. It was just a mistake. They still have <laughs> they were uh, saying- somebody told them. Yeah. <laughs> then we would have found helmets. They would have just. Um, I'll be buried with this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> too cool. yeah. Yeah. To your point though about repurposing, I can see a case for a helmet being easier to repurpose into something else because it's already plate compared to rings or a sword mm-hmm. as bar stock. You know, like because plates, you, I can see a ton of uses. That it can repair a crack on your shield. It can replace part of the boss on it. You can use it for dishware or you know patchwork stuff. Whereas rings, you have to completely melt down again to make them super useful. Swords would probably be too valuable to want to touch. So what if what if helmets were more of a more common piece compared to a sword, but also especially if they were like people theorize like the Spangen helm construction, where it's you know pieces of plate when you could. Yeah, just yeah. take a plate off and say, here, I'm going to patch this with that. And, yep. and that's a, that is a true musing right there. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting you say that, too, because there's the, the ship burial on the island of Gua off the coast of France. Yeah. And the shield bosses that were found there are of a completely new design that um, stands in contrast to the designs that we see in uh-huh. Scandinavia in that same period, which tells us that they, re- per- they, they remade their equipment mm-hmm. to suit kind of the combat conditions that were happening in in that area yeah and so if they had helmets that'd be an easy like let's just cut off this piece to help you know shape this or something that, yeah. that's, that's a thing it's a possibility <laughs> <laughs> how would we prove that we can't <laughs> <laughs> i can take apart a helmet and show you that i can take that point that's about it <laughs> yeah awesome uh so uh i always like to, to end things with a little bit of a funny note so uh as the last thing i'm gonna ask you one question What's a strange talent that you possess that no one knows or that most people don't know about you? I'll give you an example. Mine is uh, I am uh, an absolute wizard with a yo-yo. <laughs> I <did> not. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I, I probably have this uh, obsessive uh, what is it, obsessive uh, compulsive disorder and uh, slash nearing autism. And that's why I'm so really uh, insane about clima research. Uh, it gives me no life, but it's a special talent. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And I don't have anything so funny. Uh, if, if there was anything, I'd probably say I'm just persistent. I want to find the answer. And I'm not willing to give up easily until I have found the answer. Yeah, well, I'll edit that out. I'll edit that out. That is just zero humor. That is a unique talent. Yeah. He, 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 he might, it won't be funny. <laughs> Even if he repeats something somebody told him. So, so in like yeah. your time at Herswick, doing the, doing the kind of the weapon reenactment, everything, you didn't learn, learn how to throw a spear like, uh, like Achilles or anything like that? <laughs> okay. Well, I, so... CJ, uh, Herswick really hasn't done reenactment for decades. Uh, we started there. That's where we started. But, you know, we quickly switched over to pretty much pure research. And in, in order to do research, we need trained fighters. And that has been one of our goals, to have this core of trained fighters that we can use for our combat research. And so all of us have done, you know, quite a fair amount of training so that, you know, uh, at least pre-COVID, when we stopped doing most of our training, we were good at throwing spears, uh, shooting a bow, uh, you know, throwing weapons, uh, um, you know, fighting with sword and shield, fighting with an axe, all this kind of stuff. You know, we, we developed these, these skills and kept those skills relatively sharp because we need a trained core in order to do this combat research. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, there were certainly people a lot better at me than than uh, in in these things, but uh, we all had some skill and some talent there. Awesome. Yeah, this book uh, this book is written uh, on the back of uh, blood and sweat of people and bruises yeah. and uh, yeah, harsh conditions. <laughs> but unlike the Viking Age, no one had to die. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Well, we tried, but uh, <laughs> nobody wanted to. Awesome. 
Well, hey, I just want to I want to uh, give you a heartfelt thank you for joining yes, us today for this discussion. It's been very illuminating. I love the book, uh, and uh, so again for uh, everybody who's watching, it's Men of Terror. It's available on Amazon. I'll put a link uh, on the video. And uh, yeah, thanks again for for being here. Yep, Taylor, CJ, yeah. it was a pleasure meeting you, and uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about the thing we love the most: Vikings. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so happy to wet it out. Now people will not hate me anymore for a moment. At least. <laughs> we can talk about something else, politics or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, yeah, and please check out the Klima Association of Iceland, uh, klima.is. Mm -hmm.